If one more construction worker lands on his head, we can finally finish this skyscraper. Hi, it's Ryan from Knights Around the Table. Here's how you play Rolling Heights. You and your friends play rival contractors in the 1920s who are competing to complete construction projects for wealthy real estate moguls. You'll roll your staff member meeples like dice to gain construction materials that let you complete the patterns on the buildings you buy, which will earn you more meeples, points, and money to start new construction projects. When all the cubes of a certain color run out, that triggers the end of the game. You finish up the round and then play one final round before scoring private and public goals. Whoever's earned the most points wins. Rolling Heights is a deck builder at heart, except instead of a deck of cards, you have a handful of meeples. Two brown carpenters and two navy gray construction workers. And you'll use those meeples to complete buildings which often earns you more and different meeples. Everyone starts with a single level one building plan somewhere on the map. The cost to complete a project is on the tile and along the side because these spaces get covered up and you can't see them. So to complete this housing project, you need to add three wood cubes to it. Then you cap it off with your color and earn one point. And either an architect or a riveter meeple. It's your choice. In order to get the construction cubes you need to finish your buildings, you have to roll your meeples into your box, and you get different stuff depending on how they land. Let's roll! The three ways for a meeple to land are flat on its back, standing straight up, or some weird head or handstand like this. A worker who lands like this is exhausted. This meeple is working hard, and these ones are working steady. Although I'm not sure I'd say that a carpenter doing a headstand is all that steady. You'll get the most benefit from workers who are working hard. If one worker lands on top of another one, well that roll counts. But if someone ends up hung in a weird way and you can't figure out if it's ready to work or not, re-roll that worker. So you roll up to 10 meeples into your box. You only start the game with four, so roll all four. Later, if you have more than 10 to choose from, you pick 10 and roll those. They're considered your active meeples for this turn. You pluck out any meeples who are working hard or working steady. You keep rolling the other guys until at least half of your meeples are working hard or working steady. So if you had an odd number of active meeples, say five, you'd keep rolling and plucking until you had at least three working meeples, and then you'd stop. Well, let's say that later in the game you have 12 meeples. You pick these 10 and roll them. Three of them are working hard or working steady. You're not quite at half, so you roll the remaining meeples, and one more is ready to work. Oh, still not at half. Roll again. Oh, everyone's tired. Oh, well, you're not at half, so roll them again. Aha! Two more want to work. Well, that's six meeples ready for action. You could stop there, but this is a bit of a push-your-luck game. If you want more meeples to work for you, you could scoop up your remaining meeples and re-roll them. Get to work, you lazy so-and-sos! You get to keep anyone who wants to work. Oh great! Here's one more! You can keep rolling like this, pushing your luck, and keeping anyone who doesn't land sleepy. But if on any of those push-your-luck rolls, if every meeple you roll is flat on their backs exhausted, you go bust! Your workers are tired of being pushed to their limit, and they go on strike. You have to lose half of the meeples who are ready to work, rounded down. But you get a wild resource token as compensation. In order to keep downtime to a minimum, the rules say that everyone can roll their meeples while other players are taking their turns. Let's see what you can do with meeples who are ready to work. Let's build! Once you've sorted out who's working and who's sleeping on the job, you get to put your meeples to work. There are four different construction materials in the game. Wood, concrete, glass, and steel. If you have a meeple whose color matches one of those materials, you get two of those cubes for a hardworking meeple, or one cube for a steadily working breakdancing meeple. There are five other colors of meeples you can hire, and we'll talk about what they do a little later. All of the construction cubes you earn on your turn are use it or lose it. You can put them on matching spots on any construction site you own to start completing the building. If you finish it, you cap it off and collect the reward. You might earn points, or extra meeples to roll on your next turn, 
or even certain perks depending on where this building is in relation to other adjacent buildings of certain types. You can always trade two cubes of any color for a glass, wood, or concrete cube, or three cubes of any color for a more premium steel cube, as often as you like. Once per turn, you can also buy a new building plan. The available plans are in two rows on either side of the board. The level one plans are here, and the fancier level two plans are here. The cost of each plan is next to the tile, so this one costs two of any type of cube, for example. You take the plan and put it somewhere on the board, and then add one of your ownership markers to it. You can place the building site on any unoccupied land space, but for every space between the new tile and your closest existing project tile, you have to pay one cube. So place here, and you need to pay zero extra cubes, one extra cube, two extra cubes. And you have to be able to pay the number of cubes that that plot of land demands. If you can't afford to buy a certain tile and place it, you're not allowed to buy that tile. And you can't save tiles off the map for future turns. Some of the spaces on the board reward you for laying down certain types of building plans. So if you place a housing development or a park on this space, you immediately earn one point. If you buy a tile from the level one market or the level two market, and it's not one of these two end tiles, you sweeten those two tiles with one wild token apiece. These tokens can really pile up. Whichever player buys these plans gets to keep any tokens that have accrued on them. Once you've used all of the working meeples you've found a use for, and optionally bought a new building plan, in any order you like, you return all your leftover cubes to the supply, kick all your workers back to your pool, and if you bought a building plan, you slide the tiles toward the end to close the gap, and deal out a new tile to fill the hole. If one stack is empty, take the new tile from the other stack. Then it's the next player's turn, going clockwise around the table. Let's hire. Now we know enough about the game to find out what the rest of the meeples do. The green meeples are public servants. A steadily working green meeple gets you an invigoration point, while a hardworking green meeple gets you two invigoration points. Those points let you upgrade a meeple to the next level of workplace readiness. So with one point, you can turn an exhausted meeple into a steadily working meeple, or a steadily working meeple into a hardworking meeple. With two points, you can upgrade two meeples once each, or rouse an exhausted meeple into a hardworking meeple. What's going on here thematically? Is it coffee? It must be coffee. A green worker can't invigorate another green worker. You can't invigorate anyone who wasn't in the original batch of up to 10 active workers you rolled on this turn. And you can't expend a working meeple, and then use a green worker's power to make that worker work again. It's just coffee, not time travel. A steadily working yellow politician meeple earns you one point, while a hardworking politician gets you two points. A pink executive meeple gets you either two or four spending points. Spending points are an ephemeral currency that you can use in place of physical cubes anywhere in the game, except for constructing buildings. So instead of blowing cubes to buy a building plan for the market, you can use spending points. Rather than paying three cubes to buy this building plan, you can use three spending points if your pink executive meeple is working hard, or two spending points and any cube if your executive is merely working steady. You could also apply your spending points to the cost required to put a building plan down on the map, or the cost required to space it out from your other buildings. If you have multiple execs working for you, you can potentially afford more expensive building plans. But you can still only ever buy one plan during your turn. And just like cubes, any unused spending points go away at the end of your turn. You could also spend these points on commodity trades. As we saw before, two points gets you any of these cubes, and three points gets you a steel cube. A city planner meeple who's working steady lets you re-roll your exhausted meeples and hang on to whoever's ready to work. You can't go bust on this free roll. A hardworking city planner lets you take an extra building plan for free. Each hardworking city planner you have lets you buy an additional building plan over your limit of one tile per turn. The cost of the bonus tile is free, and you don't have to pay any distance fees when you place your free tile, but you do have to pay any costs on the space itself. Now, the purple meeples are public figures, and they're interesting. If they work hard or steady, they don't do anything. 
unless you've completed a building that has a purple meeple power on it. Here's one example. If your purple meeple is working steady and you've completed the Gambrel Museum, you get one extra spending power this turn. If your purple meeple is working hard, you score one point for each empty space that's adjacent to the museum, including water. So here, you get three points. Here's another example. If you've completed the City Tribune and you have a steadily working purple public figure, you get one point. If you have one who's working hard, you get to double the points from your yellow politicians this turn. Multiple purple meeples can't use the same purple meeple power on the same turn. Each one has to use a different power. Let's score. The end of the game is triggered when any single color of cubes runs out. Then you introduce these orange cubes that stand in for any cube color for the rest of the game. You finish out the current round until the last player in turn order takes a turn, and then you loop around the table and do one more final round where everyone gets a turn. Hopefully you'll have already racked up a whack of points during gameplay, but there are a few more ways to score at the end. First, there are three public goals called ads that could swing your score either up or down because a few of them actually take points away. So this one lets you choose the neighborhood with the most parks, finished or unfinished, and rescore one of your completed buildings there. A neighborhood is one of these six rectangular map tiles. This one gets you five extra points for every set of buildings containing a park, a housing unit, a factory, and a commercial building that you completed. But this one loses you one point for each of your buildings, completed or otherwise, in the neighborhood with the most factories. And those factories don't have to be owned by you in order for you to lose points from them. Next, you've been hanging on to two of these personal target tiles since the beginning of the game. Now's your chance to choose one of them and score it. Here's one that gets you three points per completed government building that's orthogonally adjacent to any of your completed parks. The parks have to be yours, but the government buildings don't. So you can piggyback an opponent's planning to earn yourself some points. If you choose this one, it lets you get one point per completed building you own that's orthogonally adjacent to water. Anytime your score marker passes the 50 points mark, throw a cap of your color on the space as a reminder to add 50 to your score. You also get one point at the end of the game for each wild token you held on to. Whoever has the most points wins, and if there's a tie, whoever has the most meeples wins. And if there's still a tie, all tied players share in the victory. Let's begin! To set up the game, start with the scoreboard at the top of the table. Randomly build the map below it. The neighborhood tiles have an A side and a B side. In a two player game, you use all the A sides. With three players, use four A's and two B's. And in a four player game, you go half and half. The B sides are more densely packed with land spaces than the A sides. Then you build the level one and level two market strips on either side of the board. Shuffle and stack the building plans and deal nine tiles out to each side. Randomly select three add tiles to use for this game and place them here. Group the meeples by color and the resource cubes too. In a three player game, remove 13 cubes of each color. And in a two player game, remove a per color total of 25. Stack the wild tokens nearby. Each player gets a box to roll their meeples, two brown carpenters, two navy gray construction workers, and two randomly dealt target tiles. Take all the ownership caps in your player color. Put your player cube on zero points. Choose who goes first at random. That player gets the start player village person. Beginning with the last player in turn order and going counterclockwise, everyone gets to take a single building plan from anywhere along the level one row and place it anywhere on the map. Just not on water and not on any spot that costs cubes to place something. Mark the plan with your building marker as usual. Then the next player in reverse turn order gets to pick and place a level one plan. But each player has to be a minimum of two orthogonal spaces away from everyone else. If you place a tile and it matches the zoning parameters on the space you chose, you get those bonus points immediately. Once everyone has placed, you slide the tiles down, fill up the row, and start rolling. And now you're ready to play Rolling Heights.
Did you just watch that whole thing? Oh, hey, to 100% this video, click the badge to subscribe and then click the bell to get notifications when I've got new stuff. Thank you.